Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and joining me today, educator by day, member of the Detroit Party Marching Band by night, I have Lauren Roberts. Hey, Lauren, how you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing very well, thank you for coming. Um, so school has just started recently back up here in Michigan. Don't know about you guys out there, but um, like I said, educator by day. How's things going for you with the school systems now? You know, good. We're finally kind of getting in the swing of some things. We're a couple weeks in now, so some of the kinks have been worked out. It's a little crazy. We're doing sort of a hybrid situation where kids are in for a couple days a week and then we have Zoom classes the rest of the week. So trying to get a handle on that, but otherwise it's pretty smooth. Okay, and now is it half and half? Yeah, so the idea is that we have sort of like a morning situation where we have small groups of kids come in, especially those that might need like extra help or might have special needs that need to be addressed um, where we can give a little bit more attention one-on-one -on -one to them. Okay. Um, and then we have full classes in the afternoons. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you teach? Sixth grade science, seventh grade literature, eighth grade tech. Man. So, yeah, jack of all trades. Yeah, you got the fun stuff, too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty <laughs> awesome, actually. So, this is Lauren, like I said. Also, Detroit Party Marching Band. I know things are kind of crazy right now with COVID. And for those of you that don't know, this is not a three, four, or five-piece band. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, this is your all-time great punk band here, your <laughs> yeah. ska band. So with this, how many members do you have? Yeah, so we have uh, 31 members, and it's sort of this punk rock-influenced brass band. Mm -hmm. So we're, uh, yeah, we're a huge group, which there have been some challenges with trying to practice sort of safely and with social distancing and kind of keeping a lot of like health risks at bay. Um, so one of the sort of issues that we ran into being a group our size um, and just all of the challenges that the COVID situation has brought is that our uh, practice space, our rehearsal studio shut down. It was part of a nonprofit and in, you know, after a few months they decided that they couldn't operate any longer, which sure. meant we lost our space so we couldn't practice. Um, so very recently, some friends of ours um, from Batch Brewing in Detroit, in Corktown, kind of saved the day and our friend Steven, um, and sort of his crew, they discovered that we didn't have a home for our rehearsal space and they're not open on Tuesdays. So they were lucky, we were lucky enough that they kind of swooped in and saved the day and allowed us to use their space kind of temporarily until we could find a permanent studio and home. Um, so that's been amazing um, and kind of hilarious. Like, you know, we're thinking about 30 people and six feet of distance you know we're talking like 180 square feet of right. space which is crazy and we uh you know mask up not only ourselves but our instruments so there's all these like dr seussian contraptions <laughs> of trying to like keep bells of instruments covered and all sure. of those kind of things but we're making it happen and we're practicing again which is really amazing and it's like sort of bringing me back to life because I missed them so much sure. and miss playing music. And that's, that's the ultimate dedication. Because like you were saying, this isn't a three or four piece band where you can set up in four corners of a room. Right. You know, and being safe and social distancing is very important. As you guys can see, there yeah. is the social distance here. Uh, we were wearing masks before the interview started, so it's very safe. Um, and we are also here to talk about your first horror movie. But before we get into that, make sure you guys are checking out all the links down here in the description. Um, so you can check out Lauren herself and you can also check out everything else on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, check out everything that they're doing. They work really hard. And like I said, to have a 31 piece brass band and rock out as much as they rock. It's such an honor to have you here. This is yeah, so cool thanks for, for me. having me. Um, and Detroit girl too, for all of you that know me know, Detroit is home, <laughs> Detroit right. is love, Detroit is life. So. But well, let's get into it. The first horror movie you ever watched. And for those of you that can't tell, uh, the first horror movie you ever watched was? It. The original. And we are talking about the TV miniseries. Um, with this, did you watch it as it was on TV or did you watch it once it came out and you had the whole everything at one time? Yeah, good question. So I saw it um, on TV as it aired. And I was seven years old when it came on. <laughs> I didn't time. know what I was getting into because... You know, it was something that it was never seen before, and sure. and I hadn't read the text up to that point because I was so young. So I'm a huge Stephen King fan now, but yeah. you know, wasn't reading a monolith of a novel <laughs> at seven. Sure. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, so that was my first experience was watching it. You know, on Sunday night airing, um, kind of like primetime network stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and it was in segments. So I remember seeing the first part of it and then the next, you had to wait another week. And then yeah. I think the next Sunday they aired part two, which was really cool. And uh, it's funny cause I am one of the rare people that I have the whole thing on one VHS. This is very rare. Usually it came in a two VHS format, which was split up into part one and part two. And this is one that my wife and I both agreed. We're not going to update. 
to the DVD or Blu-ray. Um, we still watch our VHS player. It's something that, you know, be kind, rewind, something we still stick by. This is one we decided we're not going to upgrade on. We enjoy it. I love, the, you know, even adjusting the tracking on it, getting that old vintage feel to it. It's something I really appreciate with this. Um, if you had to choose, I hate saying favorite scene. So let's, I'm going to flip it a little bit here. Which scene in the movie affected you the most? Which one scared you the most at seven years old? Yeah, ooh, okay. So, I mean, of course, I think for any kid especially, in thinking about, like, the like the whole theme of this movie is about childhood nightmares, right? And sure. kind of coming to life. So, I mean, seeing Tim Curry for the first time, like, in the sewer and how they zoom in and you see his face in those, like, terrifying chompers, uh, it's that really, you know, was a jarring sight. Um and then there were several death scenes in the movie, too, that really kind of shook me up a little bit. But, yeah. you know, as a kid, it's pretty scary stuff. The cool thing about this movie, too, and I'll get into it a little bit more later, but they didn't have a big budget for this. And a lot of people that don't remember, this was made for TV. This was not out in the movie theaters like a lot of people think it was. This was strictly made for TV. That's why the practical effects are so great. That's why the, they cut a lot that you do see in the new It chapter one and chapter two that just came out in the theatrical release, they didn't have the budget for all that. But one thing I really appreciate about this movie is the acting, both from the kids and the adults. So that kind of segues me into which part did you like more? Part one with the kids or part two with the adults? Oh, definitely part one. I mean, because I was a kid myself and sure. was actually pretty close in age to the actors in the film. So that to me kind of made it feel a little bit more real. Yeah. Um, I also, you know, thinking back at the time, because it was so early on, it was like, what, 1990, yeah. I think this came out. So it, um, you know, you have these kind of teen heartthrob characters that hadn't really like even come into prominence yet in Hollywood, you know, like Seth Green, yeah. like what? And like Jonathan Brandis, who was like my adolescent super crush, you oh, know, sure. like, please. Teen Beat. He know? was uh, he was Jonathan Taylor Thomas before Jonathan Taylor. I was gonna say the Jonathans Jonathan were like a Thomas. thing. If you were a girl in the nineties, you, your whole room was the Jonathans. He, he came just before the Jonathan Taylor Thomas and the Devin Sawas <laughs> yeah, of the world. Yeah, exactly. So, yep. and I agree with you, especially I think even watching it now as an adult, um, the Pennywise that attacks them as kids, the things that he does to the children versions, whether it be the stuff he does with the Georgie, pic the photo album. Yeah. Um, wow. Or the werewolf for Richie. Right. You know, that stuff I think is scarier in part one. I think part one is more of the scarier version, the scarier of the two. Right. And I think part two is more of the story based revenge part of yeah, the two. Yeah, the come up and um, yeah. One scene I want to talk about that not a lot of people bring up, and it's always fucked with me. Ben, when he's going down to the marsh and he sees his dad as a soldier calling him over to the yeah, sewer. Yeah, whoa. And then it pans away and it comes back and he's just a skeleton waving at him. Yeah. You know, that's a scene that I, does not get talked about a lot because with us, like I said, when we were that age, it wasn't like things are today with the effects and even the practical effects or the CGI. So seeing a, a man go from a soldier that you admire to a skeleton. Well, and being your father too. Yes. So like coping with like the death of your father instantaneously and like, whoa. Yes. So that, that's another scene that I wanted to bring up because I don't think it gets talked about enough. Um, let's talk about some death, though, real quick. Yeah, yeah. What is your f favorite death in the movie? What death affected you the most? Yeah, so I thought about this, and, you know, I think the go-to answer for most people is Georgie because it's, like, the first one, and it's so just... You don't see it coming. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I think one of the really cool things about not only this film, but the text, and like Stephen King is just like sure. one of my all time heroes, you know, he's literary. And perfect. yeah, he's genius. And, you know, the juxtaposition of like light versus dark is such a like tried and true trope in literature and in Hollywood. But I like the way Stephen King kind of plays with that and like the idea of the deadlights. Yeah. And so, like, you have this element of like, lightness and goodness and coming into the light and allegories of like heaven with that but then you know Stephen King is kind of flipping that on its head and nice. coming into the light means it's like you're meeting your death or even worse like a suspension of death mm -hmm. because a lot of the characters when Pennywise kind of ropes them in with the deadlights like he doesn't kill all of them it's like a purgatory or it's yeah. a, like people are brain dead but their bodies aren't dead right. which to me is even scarier than actual death like whoa so that all of that element is really intense um and so i think about the character of belch 
the bully. Um, and so, I mean, of course, everyone is rooting for Belch to just go under, right? Because sure. he's a jerk. Sure. But the when you see Belch's death towards the end of the film, it's the first time that we actually see the deadlights like in action. Mm -hmm. Before that, I feel like... You know, we have elements of the deadlights. We see kind of what happens with Pennywise, but then the camera cuts and you don't yeah. get the resolution. Um, whereas with Belch, just that gnarly scene of him getting like sucked into that sewer pipe <laughs> and like, yes. whoa, that was so intense. And so I think that's my favorite death. And I don't know what that says about me as a human being, <laughs> but like, that's a cool scene. Not only that, but right after that, you know, Henry Bowers says, Belch. Belch, and then the lights come back. Yeah, and, and they're scare like, him white. Oh no! Right, and his hair goes yes. white. Like whoa! And it's That's funny so you're talking cool. about suspension and purgatory. I mean, they float. Yeah, right. You know, they float down there. Right. So that's another great thing, and you're right, and that's something that um, we're going to get into the TV miniseries versus the feature film in a minute. But I don't think they played with the deadlights in the feature film as much as they did in the TV miniseries, which is a bummer to me because like you said, I think that that's awesome. The yeah, juxtaposition the of the element. light being the darkness in a way. Right. But one of the, my favorite scenes is when they're talking about Stanley's death and they're like, Stanley's talking about, I saw the deadlights and I wanted to be there. Yeah. And that kind of clicks everything back to Bill, like deadlights. And he remembers being down in the sewer and seeing those lights just go over top of them. Right. You know, so they actually explained to you more what the deadlights were in the TV right. miniseries versus the Hollywood theatrical right. release. Well, um, and the, like how dark that is, like wanting to be there and then like these strange sort of touches on suicide and how that's mm -hmm. worked in and like, wow, that's some dark stuff. Yeah. So let's talk about the TV miniseries versus the theatrical release. Which one are you choosing? Which one do you like more? You know, I, I think... I'm always a fan of sort of the first cut of anything. Mm -hmm. So I, for me, the original, especially Tim Curry, like I think the feature film and the newer version is really great and sure. totally stands on its own. But I mean, Tim Curry just in anything blows me away. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm already a favorite of the original because of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I also just like, I don't know, I think I like what they did with CGI at the time given, you know, like one of my favorite sort of moments in the film is in the Chinese restaurant sure. where the fortune cookies open up and, mm -hmm. or the, you know, and then you have all these monsters that's yeah. just sort of like claymation monsters that pop up and move around the table. And that, um, I love that scene. And it reminds me so much of Beetlejuice in the dinner scene in Beetlejuice, which is another favorite of mine. And uh, I, I just like, that to me is such a cool scene that is worked in, you know, in other ways in the newer one, but, I just like the original sure. the best. And something you and I have talked about personally is the comparisons you can make between it and Beetlejuice. Right. Um, on different levels. For sure. Which is so cool because I also am a big fan of Beetlejuice. Um, you know, I, I it's funny because until me and you actually sat down and had this conversation about Beetlejuice and it, like that's one of those like an existential like, oh. Yeah, there's so many parallels <laughs> yeah, between there them. Is so many. Um, now I want to ask you this: in the newer one, the It Chapter Two, we talked about how you know. Um, Bill Skarsgård's Pennywise is scarier. Now, when we're talking about Pennywise the Clown, and I don't know if this is common knowledge for a lot of people, but he was based on John Wayne Gacy. Right. So John Wayne Gacy, to me, that's why I like Tim Curry's adaption of Pennywise yeah. more, because he didn't look like a monster. He didn't right. look scary, just like John Wayne Gacy. Right, he was just a regular guy that had a million bodies in his you know, yeah, in basement. his cellar. Yeah, yeah right. and he he was a community guy. Right, you know, people in the community loved him. He was oh, yeah. well loved, well respected in the Working community. Working children's parties and doing community events. And right, and yeah, that's guy about town. That's why I think I, the original miniseries will always have a special place to me because Tim Curry, not only as an actor but as the clown, he wasn't scary when he was the clown. Unless obviously you're a, have a phobia of clowns, then he was <laughs> right. fucking terrifying anyway. <laughs> right. but he is the type of clown that I would have approached. You know, like, hey, For make sure. me a a bike out of a balloon. You know, here you go, you animal. Um, that's one thing that I think that they really nailed in the TV miniseries, and I think yeah. the budget. But with Bill Skarsgård, one thing that's really cool is that when you watch the It remake, and I want to make this disclaimer as well, I count It Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 as one film. Same. You know, just like yeah. the miniseries. It was just, just so long that they just split it up. You but. couldn't put out a six-hour film. Right. So Bill Skarsgård nailed it. He nailed that role. And when you watch, like, the eye movements and his stuff that he does. Oh, yeah. That's all natural. None of that is CGI. None of that is done in post. That is just natural 
him doing that, which I think is so wild, amazing. <laughs> yeah. You know, because you know me, and I know you. We're both yeah. fans of practical effects over CGI. For sure, CGI is not bad when it's done right, but when you can have an actor naturally do that kind of stuff, it's amazing. Yeah, it's so fun. Um, so we talked about your first horror movie. Now I want to throw a little curveball at you, like I always do. What is your favorite horror movie? Your favorite scary movie? <sighs> okay, so my mind goes to two places. Okay, like. One is, I think, like classic, just could watch over and over and over forever film. And the other one is the first horror movie I saw in the theaters. Okay. Um, so I kind of have a two-part answer to this. Okay. But um, my favorite horror movie of all time is also my dad's favorite horror movie. So I have a lot of memories of like falling asleep on the couch at 1 a.m., you know, like with my dad watching so this film. Cool. And yeah, which is Jaws. Like okay. Jaws is just I think a perfect film and Absolutely. the score of being a musician like that's very important to me so I love just like I mean it's such an iconic just amazing score in addition to being a great film um so Jaws is kind of my go-to well, and Jaws has some of the best one-liners you know we're oh gonna need a God. bigger boat <laughs> yeah. smile you son of a bitch you know <laughs> right, like I, right. I love Jaws right I absolutely adore Jaws I'm with you that's such a that's in my top 10 for sure yeah well and honestly what makes Jaws so terrifying is that it's so realistic mm -hmm. you know I mean because you read news stories all the time about shark attacks off of the sure. coast of Florida or Cape Cod or you know in the east coast and and every summer, that's just a reality because it's nature versus man, you know, yeah. and, and that whole thematic element. But I'm with you. I think it's. I think a, a film is much scarier when it has that element of realism to it. For sure. This could really happen to me. For sure. You know, so I, I agree with you there too. Like that's why you know these creature features like Jaws are so scary. Yeah. Because of things like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think twice about swimming in the ocean every time because mm -hmm. of Jaws. You know, I'm like, ooh. My wife, actually, we were swimming in the... I wasn't swimming. I don't get in water. Fuck that. Yeah, right. But, Too many creepy crawlies. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm a germaphobe. Everybody that doesn't know me, I, <laughs> I'm a germaphobe. I don't do that stuff. But my wife got stung by a jellyfish Ooh, yeah, when we were in the ocean. Yeah, hardcore. And I was so excited because I thought I got to pee on her. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> she like, was like, all right, yeah, let's was like, do this. She's like, no, I'm just going to die. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> just leave me here. Yeah, just, you know, just leave me here. You guys go on. Take the kids. Everything will be fine. I'm just going to die here. Yeah. You're not pissing on me, asshole. So, <laughs> um, that's a true story. Sorry, babe. Uh, love you. I love Good you so choice. much. Put that out there. I never got to pee on my wife, so people, I'm not weird. <laughs> like, I was doing it to save her At life. At least not man. on the beach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not on the beach. Um, so your other one, the first one you saw in the theaters. Silence of the Lambs. And that was like a year after I saw it. So that was a whole thing. But my mom and I went to see Silence of the Lambs together, mm -hmm. and I begged her to go see it, which is crazy that she went along with that. Sure. But I was like, that movie is just, I mean, wow. Again, talk about realism and the idea yeah. of, like, the reality of horror in real life. Like, whew. I don't think there will ever be a psychological thriller that hits as hard as Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, it's, it's beautifully done. And it's funny, you talk about the first horror film you've seen in the theaters. I still remember mine. My Uncle Dave took me to see... Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 6, Freddy's Dead in 3D. Yes! And I have Uncle Dave too. He's like my favorite person. <laughs> yes. So it's Are we related? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, that's something I'll never forget. You know, my Uncle Dave, you know, who is still one of the coolest dudes in the whole world, he took me, my cousin Al, which is his son, my cousin Josh, which is his son, my cousin Nick, which is his other nephew, and our friend Mike Marvin, who's a friend of the families. And he had, it was just my Uncle Dave and these five little shits. And I'm telling you, we were... <laughs> Little like shits. <laughs> yes. And like, I just remember leaving the theater, my Uncle Dave being like, what the fuck? Never again. <laughs> like, yeah, never, ever. Because I mean, like, my Uncle Dave, he used to take us to like WWF wrestling matches. Yeah. You know, like when they would come to Toledo and Detroit. And that was, you know, once oh, yeah. we went to an ECW Hulk, event. And the I'm, Hulk, man. I remember asking my Uncle Dave, like, the whole crowd was chanting, like, holy shit. I mean, my cousin Al were like, hey, can we say that? And he Your was like, like, earmuffs. Yeah, he was like, <laughs> You can say it this once. Don't, but don't tell, tell your dad. <laughs> don't tell. So we're all saying, holy shit. My Uncle Dave's just like, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> oh my God. Love that guy to death. That's He's so awesome. amazing. Um, so let's get, sorry, I got pulled okay, off on I Uncle Dave. I have a Dave. question for you. Okay. Who is your favorite character in it? Um, As a child, Bill. Oh, yeah. I love Bill. As adults, I love Eddie Spaghetti. Um, the best. And I, I think it's because of his overall arc, how he's yeah. always scared. He's always scared. And he finally comes as around. As a kid, he gets that. This is battery acid. Yeah. And then as an adult, he's still kind of that scared kid. Yeah. But he's like, you know, I did this once. I could do it again. This is battery acid. And then he ends up, you know, losing his life. 
protecting his friends, which you know is what he wanted right, anyway. Right, right. Um, in the newer one, I adore Finn Wolfhard. Yeah. I think he was great, and I adore Bill Hader. I think Bill oh, Hader's Bill Hader, acting in this film. Oh, it was. He's like one of my favorite actors oh, of all time. And he completely nailed it. Um, I cry every time I watch this movie, and they're in the, the lake yeah. afterwards, and he's, you know, everybody else is making jokes. Yeah. And he starts crying, and it's usually the other way around. He's right. usually always the funny one. Yeah. But now everybody else is making jokes, and he's the one that just breaks the, I cry, or I can't watch that part without crying. Yeah. And, you know, Bill Hader's always been looked at as the side guy, or, you know, the comedic relief, yeah, or the, the impressionist. the wingman, yeah. Yes, but in this movie, he absolutely stole the show. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love all the acting. In yeah, all these movies. For sure, of course. But Bill Hader stands out above the rest to me in all of it. Yeah. Um, for me, I think it... I mean, Beverly for sure, right? I mean, like, sure. please. Like, what a cool feminist move. Like, you know, Stephen King's like, the girl's got it. She's like, give me that slingshot. Yes. Uh, I got this, guys. And just, like, takes it down. It's awesome. And, I mean, her character, she's just such a, like... I don't know, such a strong character even as a child. Yeah. You know, and that's just carried out. But then also Ben, like... The, just the arc of Ben in the sort of evolution from like ugly duckling to like swan sort of story yeah. of like, you know, you've got this kind of shy, introverted, like really awkward outcast kid that's like so sweet and a poet and mm -hmm. and then turns out to be like John Ritter. It's like yeah. no wonder when that went out to theaters, there were like droves of housewives like buying tickets. It's like... Okay, good job, Ben. And John Ritter, you know, that's a that's another tragic Hollywood story. Yeah. But I mean, to me, John Ritter is not only it, but Problem Child <laughs> are, are the two John Ritters that always come Problem to my Child's mind. Problem Child, so great. First. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I haven't thought about that film in a long time. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> we just one. watched it Classic. recently because it's you know yeah, it's it, great. It, I had to show my son that movie. Yeah, absolutely. I had to. Is he a Problem Child? Oh God. Off camera. <laughs> no, he's he's the sweetheart. But <laughs> you know, he's he he enjoys. Great. I love him. He enjoys count. Yeah, you yeah, <laughs> yeah you know Kenny. Kenny's he's the best. He is amazing. Um, so we always do end this with a skull count. But before we get into the skull count, I want to ask you one more thing about the original it. Sure. Now, it's broken up into two parts. We talked about how you like the child one more. Mm -hmm. Are you satisfied more with the end of... Because this is something I've always talked about, too. The end of part one, where you're kind of left on that cliffhanger, or do you like the ending of part two, where you get to see the monster die and everybody go back to normal, a happy ending? Are you more of a fan of a cliffhanger on this ending or the happy ending? Oh, God. I'm such a, like, optimist by default, like, fiercely so. So I have to say part two because it's, like... Not only do you have the resolution of the film, which feels good to know how mm -hmm. it ends, but also like the Beverly and Ben story and how that loop kind of closes yeah. and you're just like rooting for them the whole time, you know, and it happens. Like, oh, it's so great. Yeah. So, guys, we are going to end this with our skull count. Now, I'm going to do a double curveball here because we are not only going to give a skull count for the TV miniseries It, we're going to give a skull count for the theatrical release as well. And okay. like I said, it, chapter one and chapter two, we count together as one. So let's start off with the theatrical release, or I'm sorry, the made-for-TV version Yeah. from when we were kids. Zero being the worst, five being the best. What do you rate Stephen King's it? Um, okay, so the original sort of 1990 version, I think I would give a probably like a four or 4.5. Like, okay. it, it's a solid film. I love it. Um, I... In fact, I'll go 4.5. The okay. thing that I think where I dock this one is um, just I think there are some elements of like cheesiness that sort sure. of come up. And also just I think it's a time gap. Like there's just some things that feel kind of dated about the film watching it now. But sure. I mean, that's unavoidable because, yeah. you know, history. But um, I th and I think like they could have done more with the score. I wish they could have used more elements of music and yes. in like a more creative way. Um, and I don't know. I th so I'm going to go with 4.5. Okay. Well, let's jump that up to the to the made for... Gosh, I just did it again. I flipped it. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to the theatrical release. Sure. Uh, now remember, this is it, chapter one and two together as a whole. What are you ranking that on your skull count? Mm, so I think I'm going to give that one a four. Okay. I, I like the original better. Um, but I think there are some really cool elements, especially with the technology of CGI in the newer adaptation. Um, it's really like scary and realistic. I think much scarier than the original. Oh, absolutely. Um, but I think what I like about the original is that 
so much of the horror is like played off this element of like being in your mind or part of your mind and so it leaves the original i think leaves more to the imagination mm -hmm. the newer version i think is more like just in your face horror um but i like that too but i think because the original kind of did it first i think did it better sure well, guys, again, thank you so much for watching. I was so happy to be able to do this interview in person. Thank yeah, you for coming. Yeah, oh my gosh, thanks for having um, me. For those that don't know, this is the studio we're building in my garage. So I was so lucky enough to have Lauren come down and hang out with us for the night. Um, so remember, guys, keep talking horror. Stay what you are. Check out all of Lauren's links down here in the description. And we'll talk to you guys soon. See you later.